Got through it, got to the final. I was like, I'm about to fail this final. Like, I don't understand this at all. Talk to him. This is a beauty of going to an HBCU like, like a Tuskegee. Talk to the professor. He spent three hours with me after like at five o'clock until like nine o'clock at night going over just one equation. And he broke it down to like Kool-Aid and sugar. And I was like, I have no clue what this means. Like I, and he was like, I'm gonna tell you, drop the class. And he said, change your major immediately. Welcome to Career Cheat Code. In this podcast, you'll hear how everyday people impact the world through their careers. Learn about their journey, career hacks, and obstacles along the way. Whether you're already having the impact you want or are searching for it, this is the podcast for you. On today's episode, we have someone who wanted to be a dentist and now does economic development in the city of Birmingham. Let's start the week with Coriate Hauser. Coriate, welcome yep, to the show. You got it. Welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, man. Glad to be here. Yeah. So right away, let's tell the world what it is you do for a living. Oh, the world. Let's see. I'll make it make it easy as possible. But technical title is economic development. Uh, what does that mean to the, the common folk? Uh, we try to make sure that the quality of life uh, for everybody in, in our city, particularly Birmingham, is at a level uh, that is acceptable uh, to those who are living in the city of Birmingham. So that, that's an easier way to put it. Uh, but that, that's what we do every day. Is that what you always wanted to do for a living? It's not. It is not at all. I, I, I sort of fell into economic development and, and working for a government. All right. So let's let's talk about it. So when you were yeah. young, where did you grow up? What was your <laughs> lifestyle? What was your upbringing like? And what did you think you were you were going to be doing? Yeah, well, I'm still young. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. That's right. You let them know. <laughs> yeah. No, um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll start backwards. So I think my original goal was to uh, be a dentist. Uh, I had all intentions on uh, graduating from college, going to dental school, all that good stuff. My childhood, I loved my dentist. Uh, and so that's where I got the passion at the time to become a dentist because I just loved going to the dentist. So I thought that was a path that I was going to go on, but did not happen as we see that here. All right. Well, um, first, first and foremost, we're not going to brush over that. You are basically the only human I know that ever liked going to the dentist. <laughs> Why was that a thing? Well, you know, everybody has a thorn in their flesh, right? Everybody has a, a point of them that there's little to no humility. Uh, and my teeth are that for me. Like my, my teeth is what I'm very vain about. Uh, and so in order, I thought in order to keep that, even as an adult, that I needed to go to dental school so that I could control that myself. So, yeah, I just I've always liked making sure I had a good, clean smile, healthy teeth. Um, so I didn't mind actually going to the dentist. OK. All right. So walk me through it. So you're young. You grew up in burning in Birmingham or where'd you grow up? Yeah, so I grew up in a city uh, south of Birmingham called Sylacauga, Alabama. So it's about 45 minutes south of Birmingham. Okay. Uh, yeah. Until what age? Oh, until I graduated from high school. So until 18. Uh, okay. Then I went to Tuskegee for undergrad. Got it. Okay. So you're in high school. Was college always a thing that was instilled in you? Did you always know you were going to college or what was your, like, what did that look like for you? Yeah, so uh, it wasn't necessarily instilled, but definitely uh, as an option. Um, you know, I have family members, brothers, sisters, even close cousins. Some went to college, some didn't. But I knew I, I wanted to go to college just finishing high school. I was the first thing on top of mind. I had a brother of mine had tried to get me to go into the military. Just wasn't for me. Um, you know, I, I didn't think it was for me, uh, especially at that time. I just needed to sort of take a break from the structure of school and all of that. And I just wanted to enjoy some college life. So just applied. I had an uncle who worked at Tuskegee University at the time. Um, so I had some insight into college life growing up, you know, as a teenager, preteen even. Uh, my older siblings were in college. And so I remember them. Uh, sort of going to school and coming home on the weekends and being ready to go back on Sunday. Uh, so I was like, that's what I want. You know, I want to experience that. So that was my sort of drive to go to school. But I, I also wanted to stay in Alabama to mm. go to one of the HBCUs as well. So HBCU was important to you and yeah, staying important. close to home was also important to you. So you know, I don't know if it was as much as staying close to home was important uh, as it you so, sort of was an ability, right? Um, you know, I, we didn't grow up rich uh, by any means necessary. Um, and so I think part of what my decision was to stay close to home is that I could work as well. So I could come home on the weekends or a couple of times a month. Growing up in a small city, you're able to sort of 
keep part-time jobs and, and, and do odd jobs here and there. So that was important for me to, to make money. But I definitely wanted to go to one of the rich HBCUs in Alabama. So that was very top of mind for me. Um, hmm. Being Alabama has the most HBCUs, I, I definitely wanted to stay in Alabama. What inspired that for you? What made you want to do that? Go to an HBCU? Yeah. Was it like your older siblings or older friends or like what, yeah. what made you say, you know what, that sounds like the move right there. So my older siblings uh, went to HBCUs. I had a, uh, like I said, my uncle worked at Tuskegee. I had an aunt who went to uh, an HBCU. I had a cousin who went to an HBCU. So I had so much proximity to HBCUs. That's really all I knew. And I, I thought that was the way that Black folk went to school is HBCUs. Okay, uh, you know, I knew about all of the other ones, but it, it you know, my proximity and, and sort of measure to college was definitely an HBCU. Cool. Okay. So you're going off to Tuskegee University. Are you clear on your path of <laughs> like what what it is you're studying, what it is you're declaring as your major? Are you like an, well, I don't even know how to call it, like a dental major? Very unclear. Like, what does that mean? I'll say that. I, I was very unclear. Let, I, let's start back. So I actually started as construction science major because they had a summer program. So I was ready to get to college very quick. So I graduated in May. There was a summer program uh, in engineering construction science that started in like late May, maybe early June. So I wanted to get in that because I wanted to get out of um, Silicon and, and get to school. Uh, but quickly realized, you know, I had to commit to a major of engineering. And I was like, oh, that's not what I want. I just wanted to get to the summer program. So I actually um, declared my major as biology going in. And that was just a natural love. Uh, of, for sciences and all things chemistry and, and biology. And so I just naturally fell into that because I knew I could, you know, take the classes, enjoy them, and then I'd figure it out at some point. Dental school was always in the back of my mind, but I wasn't really settled. But I was just like, here's what I'll do. And I know this biology degree will get me here. Got it. Okay. How tough were those classes? And did you <laughs> stick with that? And what, kind of so and, what, and what kind of student were you? Like, were you like um, a good student and involved or like, what were you, what were you doing? I, I wasn't as involved in undergrad. So part of my undergrad experience was framed by sort of teenage years, right? Like both of my parents were deceased uh, by the time I got to college. And so I didn't have the luxury per se to sort of be that typical college kid of just kind of like, oh, I'm going to go to school Monday through Friday. I'm a party on the weekend. I'll do some of that. You know, there, there was there were moments of that, but I was very focused in, in college. One, because Tuskegee is like a quasi private school. So it was extremely expensive. And so I could not stay no longer than four years. Like I needed to, to do those four years and, and get out of there and go make some money. So, you know, I was just a, a pretty quiet, uh, typical, normal student going to class, going out on the yard here and there. And on most weekends, uh, I either was studying or I was trying to find work to make some money. And so that that was sort of all four of my years. I lived on campus one year and then I moved off campus for the last three years that I was at Tuskegee, which sort of put me away from sort of building that college friendship and things like that. But it was the um, most economical thing for me to do was to move off campus, uh, especially being in Tuskegee. Okay. Well, first, you know, I think it's it speaks volumes of you, right? To lose your parents when you're yeah. both of your parents, when you are a teenager. Yeah. Like high school, most of us are like, we have some level of guidance from at least one of our parents. Right. Um, like for me, I had my mom there to like steer the ship. And even though she never mm -hmm. went to college here in the United States, well, actually, that's not true. She went to college later in her life um, here uh -huh. in the United States, right? So, you know, I had some level of stability that like kind of mm -hmm. helped me through that. So like, one, how did you stay clear headed enough to even make it to apply to college, mm -hmm. right? And then two, you say it very matter of factly, like, you know what? I didn't have the luxury to like go and figure out what I wanted to do, but you also didn't have to be strong enough to make it there. So like, yeah. walk me through like how you got to that path. Cause like, I think that's super important. Like you yeah. did that. I would think for me, um, so my so my dad died when I was 15, my mom died when I was 17, almost exactly two years apart from each other. But I, I will give all the credit to my parents, uh, who even at, I remember at nine and 10, 
Uh, my mom had lupus, systemic lupus. My dad had sickle cell. And so they used to always tell us that they're not going to be here always. And so we needed to learn how to manage our sales very quickly. I have a brother that's three years older than me. So we sort of grew up in that area where they were sort of in and out of the hospital. And so growing up, they taught us how to pay bills, how to buy groceries, you know, back, back then, uh, I won't say the year, you could go into like, you know, pay your cable bill with a check. And so they would send us in, they would sign the check, but we would have to get there and they would tell us how much the bill was. We had to write it out, you know, the numbers, the the letters, sign it, put the little memo there and all of that. And so that level of like responsibility and saying, hey, in order to live somewhere, you've got to pay bills. And so we were taught that very early. My mom would go up and stay with my dad sometimes in the hospital. He'd be there for a couple of weeks sometimes. And they would we would go up there sometimes family, friends and my older siblings would take us up. We'd spend the weekend there. And then they'd send us back home with money, like, you know, $300 in cash or something like that. That would be for us to buy groceries. And so we would then have to go to the grocery store and figure out like, okay, what is it that we're going to eat? Not only just junk food, but just like real food, right? And so we had to do that at like, you know, 13, 12, 13, 14 years old. But I, I will say my parents also allowed us to keep a balance of that. So we did not... Although they were taking care of each other, per se, when they were sick or like had long stints in the hospital, they made sure that we were not consumed by just going to the hospital. They still allowed us to play sports, you know, be involved. We, they made sure that we had our schoolwork. And so there was a very normal, per se, routine that we had to our life. And so most teachers, uh, until I would say 14, uh, turning 15, my dad had a real long stint in the hospital. Some teachers didn't even know that because we were still showing up to football practice, basketball, track. We were still making A's and B's in in class until one day uh, we didn't show up for school because we had overslept from being up so late on on the weekend. And I think the principal called, who was a friend of our parents, and said, wait, you know, where, where, where are the boys at? And so here we are asleep. And, you know, we were like, oh, well, here's what's happening. And we're like, what? You know, you didn't tell us. So, again, Sylacauga, um, population of 10, 12,000, I think, at the time. So very small town. Uh, so everybody knows each other. And so here we are, you know, carrying on with normal life. And then once that happened, they were like, wait, y'all can back up. Like, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. But our parents made sure that we had a good balance between making sure we were responsible, but also sort of living a normal life and not letting sort of outside circumstances define how you sort of move through that. So I think that sort of upbringing and teaching helped me as I went to school, uh, because if I if I wanted to just kind of like while out, I, I could have, right? I think I, I, I would have for all intents and purposes, deserve that. Like I, I, I was structured through high school, graduated, did the, the, the normal thing, p- applying to college, go in August and all that good stuff. But at that point, I knew how important it was to, you know, be committed, get through those four years. And then after that is where I can start to sort of, you know, relax a little bit and have fun after I actually had a job and all that good stuff. Um, so part, mm-hmm. part of that that sort of movement through college was, what my parents taught, but also that balance that they helped us get as well, helped me to to sort of navigate through college and still uh, be able to complete that with a, with a same mind. <laughs> no, that makes sense. I'll I'll share yeah. something here that I haven't shared on this show before. I mean, mm-hmm. if you know me, you know me, and this that. But yeah, it's interesting you say that because you know the way you lost your parents, there is a, a parallel to mm-hmm. so like you lost your one of your parents, your mother. So, uh, yeah, anemia? My, to uh, anemia? so uh to systemic lupus. Systemic my dad lupus and your dad has sickle cell. Got it. So my mm-hmm. sister died of sickle cell anemia. Mm-hmm. So like um it's interesting because I feel like things like that are it's not just that they died of that, right? But because right. I have the proximity to sickle cell, I recognize that you grew up your entire life right. dealing with the struggles of sickle cell. Right. It's not just, oh, one day they're no longer here and they're super yeah. young in their life, like without knowing and without asking i'm gonna assume your mom was not much older than you are right now when she passed yeah a little older yeah yeah like uh-huh. five six years yep yeah like that's a scary thought right and i'm uh-huh. thinking about my sister like my sister passed when she was 27 from sickle cell yeah. anemia and like mm-hmm. understanding that lupus 
can be very challenging on your body. Right. Sickle cell anemia can be very challenging on your body and it can be in and out of hospital. And it could be one right. day, it could be two weeks. <laughs> and like, you right. don't know until you get there. Yeah. And you just kind of yeah. get there and kind of go through it. So like, yeah, it's, it's interesting learning about you and then you learning about me and the audience, right? Like, yeah, I've never shared that here, but like my yeah. sister passed when she was 27 and like that shaped my life, mm-hmm. right? Because I was 25 at the time and I was a single man, not single. Mm-hmm. I was in a relationship, but I wasn't married Yeah, um, and then became a parent the moment mm-hmm. she died. So like, you know, it's encouraging to see someone else that has proximity to the disease yeah. in a way that is different than my struggle and different than the way that I experienced it. But impactful yeah. nonetheless right so like right right you you experience in a way that like yo you're a teenager now you have lost both of your parents mm-hmm. what does that mean for you how do i proceed how do i get over this how do i get through right. this moment and yet you have done that right like like that's that's really like i think you you are very good at just chucking through it and just making mm-hmm. it happen that the bravery in that gets lost mm-hmm. and, and like what you're doing is heroic. It's like real fucking amazing, yeah. right? Like you're experiencing all the challenges, running through those hurdles and making life happen. And like, yeah. I just want to yeah. like, I just wanted to pause for a moment because I'm like, yo, we can't just keep talking about your career because like, that's one thing and that's cool. But like right. the fact that you are doing what you're doing with all of that, it's a lot yeah. of burden to carry. Yeah, and That's amazing of you to be able to carry that with a smile on your face. Every time I've seen you, every time we've connected, it's always like life is beautiful. Like we making yeah. it, we making it work, but like it's a lot of burden to carry. So like yeah. kudos to you. I appreciate you. And I just wanted to yeah. say that. Appreciate you, man. Yeah. That's yeah. it's it's real life out here, you know. Um Absolutely. I don't I don't think I can do what I do today as effective without those experiences. You know, a lot yeah. of people say, Well, what 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 do you wish? And I say, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I wish my teenage years were different, right? Because both of my parents, like I was their last child. And so my mom, my mom didn't want to know what my dad did. And so he just begged my mom. He's like, just one more, there's six of us uh, or six total than me, a seven. So a seven total. I don't, I don't know what my life would have been if they were still alive. Right. Like I was the baby out of six, you know, I got six older siblings. I met. Uh, so I was the baby in all sense. Uh, I, I was the last one. My sister is the oldest and everybody else are boys. And so I got a hard time from all my brothers, but I got spoiled by my dad because he wanted another child and then my oldest sister. Right. Um, so I, I can't say that if I had graduated from high school, and my parents were still alive, that I would have even gone to college. I may have wanted to stay at home. Uh, and be with them and just kind of work, right? Like, I, I don't know if that drive and that determination to be successful and, and sort of get out of the space that I was growing up in would have still been there. I, I can't say that. So I, all that I can say now, it's like, I'm grateful for that particular set of circumstances that have shaped me to where I am today. And then I'm able to sort of help people uh, see past those sort of difficult circumstances that they're in, you know, day in, day out. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So shout outs to you. Yeah. You get to college. You get yep. somehow you're the baby and you lose both parents in high school. And you're like, you know what? I'm still going to college. I'm still make yeah. make it do what it do. So you get to college. You're taking biology courses and such. Are you involved? Are you in clubs? Are you in anything? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. So, I mean, just the bare minimum as far as social life. Like, I, I am solely focused on academics, trying to make sure that I can get through these classes, these labs. Uh, again, my, my high hopes is that I'm going to dental school at Meharry Medical School in, in Tennessee. So I got my eyes set and all that I knew getting up to college was put your head down and work. You'll have time later in life to play, but right now you need to work. So I had a very minimal uh, social life. I had a few friends in college. Um, that one knew my background, so could appreciate my drive and determination to like focus. But they also sort of helped pull me out of that sometimes. Say, hey, come on, let's go to this party or let's let's do this, let's do that. And so the, the balance was good for me, but that was very foreign for me to do uh, because I, I just didn't grow up like that. Uh, but I appreciated that balance. But it could have been wild, right? Like I, I didn't necessarily have a parent 
uh, call and saying, you better make sure you go to class today or you better make sure you 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 complete this semester. So I could have just wilded out for four years and just, you know, called it a day. Uh, you know, I still had my siblings. Right. But they're not my parents. And so um, that's a different set of, of expectations from your siblings and your parents. And so I just wanted to maintain that consistency that myself throughout school so that I didn't wild out. So social life, you know, here and there, uh, of course, I had my uncle who had been uh, at Tuskegee for years, uh, probably at that point, almost as, as long as I had been alive, he had been at Tuskegee. So he knew mm. almost everybody. Uh, so anytime I went and saw him on campus, you know, I'd meet somebody and sort of socialize in that way. So I had very uh, organic relationships in school. So I, I wasn't your your typical, like, I'm here to make friends. I was like, I'm not here to make friends. Uh, but if I come across somebody, great. Uh, so I've made more friends from college after college than I actually did in college. That's how intent I was on, like, making sure I got through those classes. Interesting. Okay, yeah. so talk to me through senior year. What is your major at that time? And yeah. what did you think was going to happen after graduation? So I, I'll back up just a little bit. So I was a computer science major, sort of going back and forth sophomore year. Took a class. I think it was computer programming. Got through it, got to the final. I was like, I'm about to fail this final. Like, I don't understand this at all. Talk to him. This is a beauty of going to an HBCU like, like a Tuskegee. Talk to the professor. He spent three hours with me after like at five o'clock until like nine o'clock at night going over just one equation. And he broke it down to like Kool-Aid and sugar. And I was like, I have no clue what this means. Like I got he was like, I'm telling you, drop the class. And he said, change your major immediately. So I changed my major back because I went back and forth between computer science and biology. So I changed it back to biology, get through senior year. Um, you know, I'm getting ready to select my uh, classes for senior year. What's what's next? Right. And so I start looking at dental school again. So I'm like, hey, I want to go to dental school. So here we are. So I start looking at taking the DAT. I think at the time it was near what is, 400. What is oh. a DAT, my brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a dental association test. Uh, so it's like the MCAT to get into med school. It's, it's that to get into dental school. So I start... Uh, studying, uh, or I, I buy a, a Kaplan book for DAT. Uh, but then I get ready to say, I need to register for this test and then figure out if I need to take like a summer prep course. Well, that's when the big books came in. It's like, you know, near $400. You're looking at taking a summer class, where you're going to stay, you know, all of that, that encompasses that. So I, I took a, I took a pause and I was like, break on it. Do I really want to do this? Uh, and so I called up my childhood dentist and was like, hey, I need some some advice. Like I need to know what did you do? What was your transition from undergrad to dental school to dental school from dental school to owning your own practice? Like, what does that that span look like? So I spent a few weekends. Uh, I would I would leave on Friday going home, spent some time talking to him, research some other doctors sort of in the field uh, or dentists that were in the field. And then they all sort of told me in not so direct terms, but in a sense, they all told me, don't do it. Basically, it's like it's going to be expensive. Uh, there's a lot of debt. You know, your personality. We're not sure if like that's going to really be fulfilling for you because I've always been a people's person, although I'm, I'm pretty much introverted. Most people don't believe that at all. Uh, but I always like people. And so they were like, eh, I don't think you're going to like the, this side of dentistry. Um, so I took that to heart because these were, these were people that I trusted, especially my childhood dentist. I mean, he was my baseball coach. He was also my dentist all the way through college. And so I, I trusted his sort of input, especially knowing me from childhood to now and knowing that that was the journey I was on. And so it, it, it made me pause for a minute. Uh, and so I started sort of looking at it and say, you know, if it's meant to be, It'll be, but doesn't look like this is the road I need to be on right now. Um, so I, I, I sort of laid those aspirations to the side, but I still got my biology degree because, again, I just I love science. Uh, and so I was able to make sort of the the science uh, of the world applicable to life. And so that's where I was able to sort of drive that science without it sort of leading to a medical school or dental school or pharmacy school or anything like that, which are what most of my classmates were doing. So I went ahead and uh, finished up that senior year in biology, uh, thought I was going to go and teach. And I was like, yeah, oh, no, <laughs> this isn't going to work either. Uh, you know, I, I do like to make sure people are informed, but the structure of the classroom is not it. So I ended up going into sort of the criminal justice, uh, restorative justice uh, field from that and then went back to grad school. 
what drew you to that? I think it was helping people. Um, I, I think for me, um, I've always had a, a sort of servant's heart, a servant's leadership. And so I, I knew that within that role, you're seeing people who sometimes are at their lowest, right? That they've committed a crime or they have been charged with something and they just don't know what to do. They need somebody who is on their side, but also on the side of law at the same time. Uh, and so I think being able to see this sort of transition of people who look like me, uh, people who are hopeless in some of those situations, come out of that and say, I didn't think I was going to be able to make it. I didn't know what my options were. Um, I didn't have anybody to just believe in me. That drew me to that that particular field uh, because I've, I've, I've been there, right? Like I, I didn't mention this earlier, but my going into my senior year, I had a brother who was shot and killed. Uh, that I mean, like that August, I was supposed to go to class like on that Monday and that weekend uh, he was shot and killed. And so at that at, really at that point, I was like, I don't know if I should go back to school at all at this point. Uh, just give me a break. But again, being my senior year, shout out to HBCUs. Uh, my professor was like, take a break. Like you, you've 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 plowed through quite a bit over these last three, four years. Like take a break and school will be here. Um, but building those relationships, with those professors really helped because I was able to sort of take a break as they they said I should and then enroll in school uh, later in that semester. Uh, and I, I was still able to finish, but I, I needed that break because I would have just sort of plowed through that as I always had. Uh, but it was a professor, a chemistry professor, actually, who said, take a break, man. Like, it, it's OK. Like, that's traumatic. So I took about a month, month and a half, uh, and then I, I slowly worked myself back into that. Um, so seeing that side, it you know, being on that side of the fence was was a little hard because it was like, man, what did, what just happened? But I also know uh, I had family members who were all on probation, right, growing up. So I, I knew them as family members. I'm like, they're good people. They just you know maybe did something wrong. And so it's like, well, how do you merge those two? And so that that's what really drew me to sort of the criminal justice, restorative justice uh, side of things, because I knew if people just had somebody who believed in them and that could provide them with a level of, of hope and, and inspiration that people could really change their own lives, but they just needed somebody to be there. So I've always wanted to be that that person. And that's how I ended up in that role after I graduated. Wow. So, you know, again, acknowledging you're yeah. a strong human. Like, yeah. like, that's not right. Like I lost a sibling. And that was a big moment in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, within a span of, call it six years, yeah. lost two parents and a sibling. Right. And somehow you keep trucking on mm -hmm. with this smile on your face, like life goes on and we're going to make it yeah. do what it do. Like that's, but that's real, that's real life, man. And I appreciate yeah. hearing from you, not only that, you know, at the moment you didn't realize how traumatic or how mm -hmm. impactful or, or how much you needed time to yourself, but you did it because you heard others tell you, that's not okay. Like you should like, you should be alone for a second. Right. And it sounded like you were able to take some time to yourself. First of all, I want to hear how much time, because you said a month. So I want to understand if you actually graduated within the four years or did you like graduated the semester after? Like, what does that mean? And then what happens immediately after graduation? Because I do feel like, you know, I don't know. I feel like your story is remarkable, man. And like, I feel like it's not just a professional. Like, I think you're doing remarkable things in your career, but your life is like hurdle after hurdle and you're just out yeah. here jumping them and like, <laughs> and like doing it with a smile. Like, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was, um, so I actually, I finished in uh, the fall of 20, 2009. I finished in the fall of 2009. So I was a semester after so technically, I would have graduated in May of 20, uh, 2009, but I finished actually all my classes in uh, the fall of 2009. And then uh, at the time, Tuskegee only had one graduation. So I walked in May of 2010. Um, so for a Got semester, I, you know, I just was I was out working, actually, and I came back for graduation. So it did sort of it sort of set me back. I, I ended up taking a summer class because I, I lowered my load that semester. Uh, I know I needed to get back because I, like once I 
got used to not being in school, I'd be like, okay, I'm just not going back. Or maybe I would have. I don't know. I, my, my assumption was that I wouldn't have gone back. And so I, I did sort of take a break for about a month, month and a half. And then I lowered the amount of hours that I took that particular semester. And I was like, well, I'll just make them up at some point. Uh, and so ended up doing, actually, I think I did two summers because I, I took one of the, the harder classes for biology in the summer with lab, just that class. So I didn't have to do all of them at one time. And so that was, you know, one of the sort of one of those decisions like, man, I could be graduating in May of 20, uh, 2009. But I also didn't want to put that pressure on myself either because uh, I knew I, I, I was at almost a crumbling point. I knew if I had put just a little bit more pressure on myself, I was like, this, this isn't going to be good for anybody. Um, so I, I did take a break and sort of step back. And so a part of that is my faith. Um, I'm a very spiritual person. I, I'm a person of faith. I think that's why I draw to sciences uh, pretty easy because I do like those uh, intermingling with each other. Uh, and so that helps me sort of carry carry on uh, throughout life. And so, you know, I finished my courses December 20, uh, 2009, walk May of 2010. Uh, and then I, I come, I go back home to Silicaga um, and I, you know, find this, this job to uh, help with restorative justice and uh, creating programs and, and, and managing folk um, in, in that field. So, you know, I've worked since I was 15. My first job was a, at Food World. I don't, I don't, you know, in the South, we had Food World. Uh, and so I worked as a cashier and bagger uh, at 15, uh, which, you know, I thought was, was bomb at the time. Like I'm getting paid, I'm working, going to school. And so I've always worked. And so I, I, I've always found myself in sort of leadership capacities, um, and I don't say that to sort of like brag about it, but I think I, I, the way that I grew up, I was afforded to learn responsibility and sort of taking things very serious. And so at a young age, I was always sort of thrusted into some sort of leadership position, even at, at 15 and 16. And so in the summers throughout college, I'd work at this summer camp in, in Silicaga. Uh, sort of led some teams there. And so by the time I graduated, I mean, I had a full resume of like leadership roles, even at, at 20. And so I, I started in Sylacauga, uh, moved to a county that was about 40, 40, 40 miles away, uh, Calhoun County, and started there. And I actually started managing two offices there that, you know, we had folk who were 20 year vets in the in, in the industry. Uh, and then some there were five, but here I am, the new kid with a biology degree uh, from Tuskegee. They're like, what is he gonna tell us about criminal justice or restorative justice? But what I did have was compassion uh, for what I was doing. I had knowledge about how people just live their lives, right? Like I'm, I'm not your, your, uh, a judgmental person. Uh, I've had, you know, family members on drugs. I've had, you know, family members killed. I've, I've seen family members in, in jail and the whole array of that. And so I understand how life can sometimes just be hard. And sometimes people make a bad decision uh, in, in a moment, but that doesn't define someone's life. So I had all of that coming in with me. Uh, and so I was able to really work in that job and and actually create another level of compassion that I didn't have going in. Like I, I had a sense of it, being able to see that many folk on the line of whether they're going to be in jail for a year or 50 years, or I'm about to lose my children, my house. I need this, that and the other. If I can't pass a drug test, here's what here's what what will be taken from me. Um, so seeing that that life can change in like a matter of minutes, um, you know, from a judge signing an order, you know, that was very powerful to me to think I, I make a choice uh, or I'm around certain folk. I'm in a situation that involves now the law, police, lawyers, all of that. And my entire life can be signed away by someone who only hears certain sides of the story. That was so impactful to me. And I, I just wanted to make sure, even at the time that I was there, that we allowed ourselves, obviously to deal within the law, like we, we, we're not gonna break the law, but to allow ourselves the compassion to say, let's that could be your brother, that could be your sister, that could be your child, your niece, whatever descriptive you wanna put on that, it could be someone in your family. And how would you want someone to treat your family member or yourself? Like that could be you mm -hmm. uh, if you were in that situation. And so that's what I was able to bring to that team uh, and ended up having like four or five offices like under under my leadership. And 
You're talking about hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't know hard until I got there. Because, I mean, you know, you got folks who are experts. Like, they've been doing this, the tactical and very technical sides of uh, restorative justice for a while. And so I brought mm. this sort of innovation and newness of, like, but these are people. These are not files. These are people. Uh, and mm. so it was hard to get some of the team members to understand that this is just not a file that you sign off. They came in for their appointment. They took their drug test. They finished this program. You close it, move to the next one. That is a person. And how do you deal with a person uh, is what we were really uh, targeting at. Okay. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that <laughs> you did know hard before that, just not professionally. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. You did know hard. Okay. So then you went through that. Tell me, this is your first real job, technically out of college. Yeah. How much money are you making and what is your actual day to day look like? So at that time, I think I was making 40, 40,000 a year in Alabama. Damn, you, you bought yeah. <laughs> it. was OK. I'll say that it was OK. Uh, but I will, Alabama is a very, very cheap cost of living. So I was able to, to really uh, make some strides. Yeah. Make some strides, he says. Heard it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, about 40000 a year um, day you, to day. Yeah. What were you actually yeah. doing? Because you were managing folk. But, like, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. So, the hard cases are what I would get, right? The judge would assign those hard cases to the manager um, to sort of see through. But on a day to day basis, I am looking at a caseload from every office that I'm managing to see who's out of compliance, uh, who's uh, what we call the time was being revocated, which, you know, being sent back to court uh, and trying to figure out, is there some sort of intervention that we can do before a warrant is put out for their arrest or their probation uh, is revocated, uh, which means they go back before the judge for basically breaking what they said they would do in their, their uh, probation order. So I was sort of overseeing that that sort of case management for those who were on their way back to court or who may have been uh, about ready to be issued a warrant because they missed appointments or failed a drug test or something like that. The other side of that was just the people management, right? Like, are you showing to work on time? You know, you got five appointments today. Why are you only seeing three? Like, don't don't make people wait just because whatever. Uh, so it, it was a balance of the two. Uh, but I, I also went to court. Uh, I was in court several times a week, uh, often sitting uh, on the bench uh, the way that it was set up at the time with the judge. There's a court clerk and prosecutor, all that good stuff, really looking through what options do we have to rehabilitate someone, right? And some of these are really small, right? Like it's, well, I say really small, but I mean, breaking the law is not all that small. So um, you get like, uh, a domestic uh, dispute, right? Uh, there, there's the police are called out because that some two people are uh, fussing with each other, and so depending on that one person's background, that depends on how that case is being seen in court. And so I was sort of there to help bridge the gap to say, wait, wait, you know, he's he or she is working full time. They've not been, you know, engaged in any sort of criminal activity as far as what we see on paper in five years. If we give them this order right now, they're no longer able to work. They're not productive citizens to the society, you know, all of those things. So why don't we look through the different programs that we have that can help them get to where they go? But I think one key thing that I always brought up is I would always ask anybody that I dealt with, what do you want to do? You know, it, it do... And sometimes I started education, right? Uh, because the area that I was working in, some people did not have college degrees. And so we may start with, do you want a GED? We'll add that to your probation order. Um, would you like to go to you know, a court referral program that teaches you about alcoholism and gateway drugs and things of that nature? Do you need assistance with your family? Like, wh what is it that you want? Uh, now, obviously, everybody's not going to tell you that. So sometimes it's me telling you this is what you're going to do, obviously, with the judge's order. But that was that was sort of my three prong. It was the people management it was sort of the, the high level case management and then sitting in court and sort of listening to these cases to often recommend to the judge, here's what I would recommend in the program for this person. Uh, but that's my that's case by case. So I'm, I'm having to read files and understand and sometimes talk to them, right? Like a judge will send me out and say, here's what I'm ready to do. You know, 30 days in jail and here's what, and he'll say, but if you want to talk to him, 
We'll send you out there to talk to him. We'll we'll get through it. And sometimes I'm successful, right? Sometimes I'm not. Some people are just like, I don't want to hear. Just I want to pay the money and be done. File with mm-hmm. me, but let me let me let you understand. Once this hits your record, if you do this again, now you're on this path that a revolving door that you make can't get out of. So let's think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how long did you do that for? And Ooh. talk me through what that transition that transition out of that looks like. Let's see. I think I did that for about three years. Uh, so a good, a good, good long term there. Th- about three years that I did that, uh, and then I actually that's when I moved to Birmingham to start a master's program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So it's an executive uh, sort of level master's program, uh, technically a master's in engineering. Um, so we really studied around business, government, and innovation. Uh, so those were sort of those three themes that we had through the program. Uh, so it was an intense two-year program. We met once a mm-hmm. month for two years on the weekend. And then we had, you know, coursework throughout. But that's what transitioned me out. Is actually I got accepted into that program and knew that I didn't want to drive back and forth to Birmingham. Why'd you want to do that? Like what made you say, you know what, let me take on some more debt and go get a <laughs> master's program? Um, I think it was, you know, I had my biology degree. I had proximity to business just from experience. But I didn't have sort of that technical book knowledge around what business management and sort of all of that meant. And I just wanted to make sure that what I was doing was right, <laughs> you know, to be honest. And I had some some context around, you know, literature, case studies, best practices, professors, all that good stuff. Uh, I wanted to make sure I had that knowledge and background uh, and to learn something new. Right. Like, I, I mean, I'm still under 25, 26 at the time. So I'm still young. Uh, and so I, I'm like, I don't know everything. So I need to be in a space where I can continue to grow. Uh, and so that's what led me to, to get in that program. So tell me what happened when you were going into the program. What did you think you would be doing afterwards? And what did you actually end up doing afterwards? <laughs> what did I think I would be doing? Definitely something within a sort of software company. Um, and, and let me let me pause there. I think I thought I would be doing that forever. Like I thought I would retire from some large software corporation uh, working somewhere in like product management. That That's what was sort of my my outset uh, to going into this program, because there was a, a piece of it that was very innovative and technology driven before we got to all of the technology that we have today. Uh, I, I don't want to say back in the day, but some time ago, all of these uh, technology that's, enhancements were not. That's there. right. We're not that old. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so I thought that's what I would do, you know, because it was it was a hot item at the time. Uh, I had the experience on the business side. I didn't have so much of like the technical expertise. Uh, and so I thought, oh, this would be great. I'll just move into that world role and, you know, I'll be a black guy in tech and I'll be good to go. Yeah, di- didn't happen that way. Now, I did work at a tech company. though. I-, I worked at a software company for about three or four years, actually, uh, while I was in grad school, like without within like a maybe less than a year uh, after I moved to Birmingham, I actually started working with a, a small startup, uh, which is a technology company. And so I was able to apply some of the things that I was learning in class to that job, but then also being able to see from real life experience what actually happens and then go to class and say, this doesn't make sense. Like that's a case study, but we just did a sprint planning and it did not go in this waterfall that you guys just explained to us. So I was like, help me understand how this really works. And and one thing about the program was good because we had a lot of uh, our professors and lecturers were CEOs or they had worked uh, in technology or innovation or government and retired and they were coming back. So we had a good balance of that. So I couldn't wait sometimes to get back to class and say, here's Here's what I did at work. Here's the book that we read. These two don't match. Can somebody help me? Uh, so that 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 was pretty fun. Nice. Well played. Okay. Yeah. So you did that right after graduating from your master's yeah. Yeah. in technology school, the master's in engineering yes. or in information engineering and management. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I could read. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. All right. So you did that. Tell me what happens next and tell me what, like, there's a big leap between where you started, 
what you thought you'd be doing when you were a teenager, what you were, what you thought you'd be doing when you were in college, what you thought you'd be doing going into a master's program, what you were doing right after your master's program, and what you're doing now, right? Like this yeah. big leaps that like yeah. you started out as a dentist, like yeah. or as a like aspiring dentist, I should say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, okay, so tell me what happens after this moment. You know, I, so I graduate, still working in in the tech space. Uh, I get an opportunity to move to a new tech space uh, or tech company. I did that for three months, actually. I, I, I remember like the back of my hand, I did it for three months. And the CEO called on a Friday uh, and said that they were closing down their Birmingham operation. So part of what I was hired to do was was expand uh, outside of their their current city. And so Birmingham was their, their city that they wanted to expand in. But they wanted to do it at, at a very rapid pace. Uh, that was just not happening quick enough for them. And so did that for about three months, get a call from the uh, corporate office and they say, hey, loved it, just not working for us in Birmingham. We're going to close down today. Like effective today, you no longer have a job. So I went from very stable employment up until, you know, taking sort of a risk. Like I I went into that role knowing that it was risky because I could not sort of get answers that suggested longevity. But I was also at a, po- a moment in life where I was like, you know, everything doesn't have to be so structured. So that, that in between these times, I'm also going to counseling and therapy, still trying to manage emotions from my parents, my brother's death, and now I'm out of school. And so now I'm able to really grasp what it feels like to be an adult. So on, on the personal side, I'm going through counseling and therapy, trying to make sure that I'm able to show up as my full self at work. Um, so the, the opportunity that came, I was like, you know, do I want to know about 401k? Yes. Uh, do I want to know about a five-year plan? Yes. Are they giving it to me? No. Uh, should I not take this opportunity? Probably not, you know, uh, but I did, right? Like I was like, I need to challenge my own self. Like I've up until that point, I've been able to navigate jobs and life in a way that was very comfortable because I was able to do that through research. You know, you apply, you interview, you go and work, you know what you're going to get paid, all of that. And I was like, this is very comfortable for me. And I never want to be in a place in life where I'm comfortable. Uh, And so I took the position. And like I said, it, it about two weeks before, I was like, hmm, we're having a lot of meetings. I feel like this is about to end. And so that Friday when it happened, you know, it shocked me for a moment. I was just like, I can't believe I just left a very stable position to come here. And now in three months, I am out of a job. What am I supposed to do? Right. Like I've always worked. I've always prided myself on being able to provide for myself and and be responsible and be sustainable. Uh, So it took me about a week (laughs) uh, to get over that. And I was like, you know, that was a fun experience. I think I learned a lot mainly about just not being boxed in, right? I I think that opened up a a level of like personal innovation that I would not have unlocked, right? Because I I was able to, I'm able at that point to like go into jobs with some longevity, but this one did not provide that. And so what do you do? Because now this can happen at any time. So I go into every job now, like the next week they can lay you off, right? Uh, And so how do I now make the most impact in the least amount of time? That's our approach almost every situation. Like, I don't, I'm not here for a long time. That's a short and good time. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for a good time, not a long yeah. time, you know. I. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that and I that that helped me live that uh, in a mm. professional way. You know, we, we do it personally, but really in a professional way, like I was able to like really body that and understand like you need to carry that throughout your professional career as well. Um, mm. Because you may not get the opportunity to to always just sort of be there for five or six years. So anyway, so I I, I did that. Um, took about a week or so uh, to just kind of recap, and then I moved into the next role, which was at a science center. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, a science center that tracks for the biology. Yeah. Right. Major. Right. Right. Yep. First of all, up until that point in your career, did you feel fulfilled with the jobs that you were doing? The technical aspects of the job, no. Hmm. But all of those roles uh, involve people or helping people somehow. So I got fulfillment in part of the job because it was always bridging the gap to help people somehow, whether it was through restorative justice programs or even at the software company, it was a 
uh, e-signature site. Uh, and so being able to know that I am helping a doctor or a nurse sign paperwork that will then in turn help patients, like that was my driving force. Like I wanted to see that happen. But the technical aspects of like learning project management and learning how to talk to software engineers and, you know, filling out court paperwork and documents, that was not fulfilling at all. So there was only yeah. pieces of fulfillment. That makes sense. I mean, but it's important to be able to see the bigger picture and right. step back from your day to day and say, okay, but ultimately, what am I doing? Ultimately, right. I'm helping people right. in different spaces, in different industries, in different right. ways. But ultimately, that's what I'm doing. So right. it's fascinating to me that you, as someone that has not had the easiest route to your professional career, have the wherewithal, I think it's a, it's a way to, to say whatever, yeah, that's know it. how to look to step a hey, Listen, I'm an immigrant. English is my second language and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so like, like to be able to step back and say, you know what? I feel like at the end of the day, this is what I'm really doing. This is what I'm actually working towards. And this is how this is helping people. That's huge. I don't know that yeah. everyone can do that. I don't know that we can all step back from like, okay, this is my day-to-day -day function. This is how it's annoying. This is how it's great. But ultimately this is what it's working towards. And mm -hmm. that's, remarkable that you under the age of 30 were able to like put those pieces together and say you know what i'm doing something that contributes to the larger puzzle mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's remarkable yeah no it, it you know it, it it didn't come easy right like I, <laughs> it, it was me centering myself again mm -hmm. like being so young and losing parents i had to learn how to center myself very early mm -hmm. otherwise i'd just be off the rail uh mm -hmm. and so growing up with that sort of muscle memory. By the time I got into like a professional career, it was easy for me to navigate having to center the bigger picture. Uh, Cause I'd, I'd, at that point I had done it for, you know, nearly 15 years mm. and, and been able to do that. So it, it was a, it wasn't necessarily easy, but it's something I knew I had to do. And so, I, you know, it just came with the territory. Absolutely. Shout out to therapy. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out. Everybody get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it. Go, yeah. go, go do that. It, yes. I do it. You do it. It, it yeah. makes a difference for sure. Please, uh, yeah. um, okay. So tell me a few things. One, tell me what happens next. And then two, tell me what, what keeps you thinking about that continuous pivot, right? Like yeah. it sounds like some of it sounds like happenstance, right? Like, okay, I'll just do the next thing. But like, I'm sure a lot of it is strategic. Like you're like, okay, yeah. what do I want to do? How do right, I get right. there? So tell, walk me through some of that process of like, if I'm going to move on, what does that look like? And why am I making that move now? I would say the older I get, uh, part of it is like mental clarity and, and mm. peace of mind, right? I don't, we spend too much time at work for it to be hell, right? Whether I'm causing it or some, or it's the environment, like it's just too much. Uh, right. Eight hours out of your day, nine hours, 10 hours, whatever you work, it's a lot of time at work. Uh, and so some of those moves are more, what brings me the most peace and how do I have mental clarity to be who I am? You know, that's I'm not trying to be the uh, manager, Corey Ate. I'm not trying to be the economic develop, developer, Corey Ate. I'm not trying to be uh, the Corey Ate that has a master's in engineering. I'm just trying to be Corey Ate Hauser, who my sister named me, right? Who, who is that person? And can I show up every day as that person? If that starts to misalign, either I need to voice that or I need to make a, a change and a pivot so that I can align that. And so that's where I start really seeking how I'm in certain spaces. Now, some spaces I, I grow in, right? Like there are certain times, again, being sort of a person of faith and, and sort of spirit, sometimes I'm just like, you know what? Maybe it's just the season I'm in right now. I need to learn. I need to sit down. And these are hard lessons that I need to learn. There's you know, uproot from like life experiences that have taught me to respond in this way. Maybe I do need to look at responding another way. I can give space and acknowledge when those times are there. But then after I've worked through that, I'm like, okay, I've done that. I feel like it's the, my time to move on. And strategically, what does that look like? Uh, and so I try to give my space, I mean, give myself space to grow, uh, even when it's uncomfortable. Um, that That is something that I'm not afraid of if it's uncomfortable, that may need, may need I need, may mean I need to grow, whatever way that may be, professionally, mentally, personally, relationships, whatever. Uh, but outside of that, once that growth has happened, 
and I feel like I'm I'm ready to move on, then I strategically start trying to place, then what's next? If, if this is not it, then what's next? And how am I leaning into that next, either by network or am I like looking for a particular job? And sometimes yeah. it's just network. Like, you know, who am I around most of the time? You know, what am I watching? What am I reading? You know, all, all of that stuff starts to lean me in a way of like, huh, you should probably look at this. So, so uh, sort of a nomad in a sense, you know, it's just kind of, you know, what's happening at the moment. And I think that's how I sort of fell into some of those roles that we talked about earlier. It was like, what do you feel right now? Uh, and how can you be most impactful going back to, I'm not here for a long time. I'm just, I'm just here for a good time and short time to be most impactful. So that's how I've transitioned and navigated through some of those movements uh, and yeah. being a little bit more strategic with it. All right. So tell me in a little more detail what it is you do right now. Woo. Everything. Um, so I, I work at the city. We're, we're coming on around to the home base, right? So um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to serve as deputy director uh, for the Department of Innovation and Economic Opportunity at the city of Birmingham, where my great mayor, uh, Randall Woodfin, serves as mayor there. Um, but essentially, day to day, I am uh, looking through how do we improve Birmingham, uh, its marketability, uh, and then how do we attract folk, both businesses and people into Birmingham? Um, and then I think third aspect of that is improving the quality of life for folks who are here. Uh, what, what does that look like for those who are already here? Do they have access to quality jobs? If they don't, what do we need to do as economic developers to attract those quality jobs? And then how do we make those sustainable? which then feeds into our taxes that fix roads and infrastructure and, you know, support small businesses and, you know, city owned assets and real estate. Like, can we leverage those for people to come in and start businesses? So all of that is what I do in a day, sometimes an hour. It just depends on the day. That's fair. What's the favorite part of your job? Favorite part of my job, getting a contract passed through city council. Mm. Okay. Why is that? Um, cause I think it, it, it's sort of a reward of, of months of work, right? Like it's back and forth with vendors. Um, it's looking at economic impact to use city dollars. So one thing that, that we do typically when there's an agreement going before council, it's an incentive agreement of some sort. And so what happens is you're going through that business profile. You're saying, if we incentivize you to either expand, grow, or come to Birmingham, we are using taxpayer dollars of hardworking residents in Birmingham. We need to make sure that the impact that you will provide over the next three, five, 10 years greatly outweigh this incentive that we are considering giving you. And I think the, the, the reward for that is being able to stand in front of council, our city council, with confidence that we have stewarded the taxpayer dollars in a way that's going to be beneficial, not only for us as a city, you know, we, we can say, oh, we recruited whoever, but also to the citizens, because outside of that, we're able to say there are 200 new jobs coming to the city of Birmingham. Here's the average salary. Here's their recruitment plan. And then here's on return what we're giving them from incentives uh, from taxpayer dollars to uh, come and operate in Birmingham. So that that reward to see that pass through nine counselors to all have different uh, priorities. They have different districts. You know, there are times where those businesses come in and they are more beneficial to certain districts just because of their location than others. But for all of them to see the big picture and vote yes on a, an agreement is so rewarding because sometimes it's six, eight months or a year. Uh, in the making, sometimes two years, you know, in the making. And just to see that vote of confidence that we made the right decision and that all agree is like, I mean, it's it's, it's like the best best time uh, on Tuesdays. OK, folks that listen to this show know, but I normally ask this question, which is, you know, I'm a big believer that you don't have to pick between doing good and making money. Yeah. So can you help me understand? <laughs> it could be a, a range, a scale, yeah. like how much money can someone make doing the type of work that you do with this type of experience? I would say, particularly for Alabama, you can make anywhere between probably 125 to 160. Got it. K a year. That's huge. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then are there any media <laughs> that you can point to that you feel like have had an impact in your life, right? Whether personally or professionally. So like that could be a show, mm. a podcast, a book, 
a movie that you're like, this thing shaped the way I look at things? There's probably some I could name, but I, I would say the most impactful that I always come back to seventh grade, I had to read and recite Robert, Robert Frost, The Road Less Taken. That last stanza of that poem has always been my absolute favorite. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a yellow wood and I, I took the one less traveled by. That has been like mm. key to any decision that I make is I go back to that last stanza and say, you know what? I'm, I'm deciding. But at the end of the day, the road less traveled is what's going to make all the difference for me. May not be for everybody, but for me, that's what's going to make the difference. So that's what I like my all time favorite. You know, I can name books and all that good stuff, and they're good. Like I'm not negating that, that their legitimacy, but that is the one that really will get me driving and like intellectually starts turning a wheel in me uh, to to navigate down a road that maybe I would not do on my own. I love that. Okay. Yeah. At this point in your career, what kind of doors are open to you? Like if you wanted mm -hmm. to at the end of the term of the mayor or whenever, yeah. decide to move on to the next phase of your career. With your type of experience, what could you be doing? Ooh, um, there's a couple of things. I think um, there's a natural step um, for leading a like philanthropic organization. Um, so executive director, however you, you sort of title that. So leading uh, a sort of social impact, social mobility, economic mobility. There's so many names for, you know, how they get there, but leading an organization of such uh, that focuses on impact uh, around the, the country. Uh, I think another opportunity looks like, particularly for me and how I navigate through our city hall and, and with our mayor uh, is like a chief of staff and slash senior advisor as well. Because of how we have economic development set up in the city of Birmingham, it involves about six other operational lanes, which always puts us sort of in these different spaces of workforce and uh, real estate management, your classic economic development, small business. And so with all of that, it's, it's really an engine of the city. And so with the experience that I've had, there are other cities who are like, I need someone to, to sort of sit outside of that and be an advisor to the mayor who's knowledgeable enough to sort of know the ins and outs. So I think those three uh, are sort of, or really doors that have opened. And honestly, that have opened. Like I, I've talked to some folk uh, and they're just like, you know, I need to get your advice on this. I was like, well, that's not my day-to-day -day job, but I get why you asked me that because of the proximity of, of projects that I work on. So I, I think those are sort of the natural steps uh, that, that doors are open. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything? Is there anything else that we have not discussed that the world should know about you? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I would just encourage people to like take time, right? Like, it, it's not all perfect. Uh, we're not going to all have it figured out in a year through college, you know, through junior college, through an apprenticeship, through working up to management at a, at a you know restaurant or bar. Like, we're not going to have it all figured out, and I don't think it's ever too late to to start over. And really, it's not starting over. It's really how do I use my experience up until this point to now do something else? Uh, it goes back to that that those two roads diverse in a yellow wood. Which which one do you want to take? Do you want to keep down the one that you know, or do you maybe want to go to the left or right? And 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 that makes the difference for you. That's beautiful. All right. Yeah. Thank, thanks for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and believe on the mission we're on. Please like, rate, and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you're using and share this podcast with your friends and your networks. Make sure you follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at Career Cheat Code and tell us people or careers you would like to see highlighted. See you next week with some more cheat codes. Peace.